Okay, Spinoza discussion. Um, by now you've done something really hard, which is if you've read Spinoza. <laughs> uh, his style is, um, it leaves a lot to be desired, but nonetheless, um, it, generally I find these appendices, um, for example, the one on uh, starting on 160, uh, to be the handiest to actually sketching out the general position uh, that Spinoza is trying to um, argue for here. Um, it all stems from that ontological argument and a really hard sort of interpretation of what follows from the ontological argument for Spinoza. If God is a perfect being, uh, God can lack nothing, so therefore God cannot lack substance. Um, this is the manner in which Spinoza winds up marrying substance, matter, nature, and uh, the essence of God. So God as nature, nature as God. Same thing. So what are we but aspects of God? Now, interestingly, when he's discussing um, it, the free will as it pertains to God, he even claims that God it lacks a free will. All of God's acts, well, first off, they're imminent rather than transcendent, but nonetheless stem from the necessity of God's essence as perfection. Now, explicating this in the uh, the appendix to section one, it's you can see that, that, that Spinoza winds up being a hardcore determinist, right? All of our actions are determined. Um, he writes um, on your page 160 in the appendix, um, however, it's not appropriate here to demonstrate the origin of these myth misconceptions from the nature of the human mind. It will suffice to, uh, at this point, if I take as my basis what um, it must be universally admitted, that men are, all, are, are born ignorant of the causes of things, that they all have a desire to seek their own advantage, a desire of which they are conscious. From this it follows, firstly, that men believe that they are free precisely uh, because they are conscious of their volitions and desires, yet concerning the causes that have determined them to desire and um, uh, will, uh, they, they do not think, not even dream about uh, because they are ignorant of them. Second, men always act with an end in view to wit uh, the advantage that they seek. Hence, it happens uh, that they are always looking only for final causes of things done and are satisfied when they find them having, of course, no reason to, for further doubt. But if they fail to discover them uh, from some external source, they have no recourse uh, but to turn to themselves and to reflect on ends or on what ends uh, would normally determine them uh, to similar actions, and so uh, they necessarily judge other minds by their own. Further, since uh, they find within themselves and outside themselves a considerable number of means uh, very convenient for the pursuit of their own advantage, as, for instance, eyes for seeing, teeth for chewing, uh, cereals and living creatures for food, uh, sun for giving light, sea for breeding fish. The result is that they look on all things of nature as a means to their own advantage. Uh, what Spinoza, at least partially, is doing in this passage is laying out the basis for uh, what he considers to be the delusion of human nature. Now, for your discussion forum, what I would like you to do is, given your understanding of Spinoza, given what, what you've read, given the uh, supplementary materials, given your own reflections, uh, offer an account of um, Spinoza's treatment of the free will, which for him amounts to a rejection of the free will. He counts it among the great human delusions. Um, so uh, that is your discussion form question. I look forward to reading your responses and um, go. All right.